I know, Jim, I say it all the time. Every episode is the best episode ever, but I can't tell you how excited I am tonight for the subject that we're tackling. Star Trek Adventures, Captain's Log gets richer and richer, and tonight I think we're going to be adding a lot of flavor to players who have science or medical officers, or if they have main characters who also have soft science skills. We're get into that into a moment for those of you who might be new to the show i'm michael dismuke i'm the lead editor lead writer on uh, captain's log solo rpg and also a freelance writer for star trek adventures rpg Um, i'm a blogger on continuing missions which we proudly hold the claim to be the number one fan site for star trek adventures rpg and captain's log up to this date and hopefully we can keep that going forever and of course this would not be a show if i did not have with us tonight jim johnson Hey everybody, Jim Johnson. I am the project manager and line editor for the Star Trek Adventures RPG and the Captain's Log solo RPG, both published by Modifius Entertainment. Lo, these many seven plus years now, heading into year eight, super excited, lots of great stuff to come, lots of great stuff behind us. And we have a super cool show tonight talking all about soft skills. And I think it's not just for science and medical, it's it's also for anybody in a leadership position, any manager, any manager, any people manager, as they call it in the corporate world, you're people manager (laughs) it's like so whatever buzzwords um but uh, whether you're a captain a first officer a department head a junior department head like even even a lieutenant jg you might be put in charge of your first uh your first away team like boimler on a recent episode of lower decks that's that's there's soft skills there there's soft skills in everything you do whether you know it or not so we'll see what the conversation brings up tonight and i am super excited to to bring back two wonderful guests we've had them on the show many times before i'm super thrilled to see them here again i miss you both i miss talking to you both on a regular basis um and i'm thrilled to have you here thank you so much for being back and uh, i'll just have you all do your introductions i'll just go clockwise around my screen as you do uh bc why don't you introduce yourself sure i'm bc holmes i'm the current maintainer of the star trek adventures character creator at sta.bchomes.org <laughs> we love you we love you for that <laughs> thank you. essential essential so critical so essential yes <laughs> Awesome. Thank you, BC, for being here once again. And uh, Aaron, please introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Aaron Pallier. I'm uh, a longtime freelancer for Star Trek Adventures. Uh, I'm I'm generally your starship guy, science guy, uh, technology, all that. I, I wear many hats. I've written some adventures. But yeah, I'm here for many reasons today. Mm-hmm. And uh uh, we shouldn't talk about that. Okay, never mind. Wait, 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 hold on, hold on one second. And and uh, just so you know, we may have someone coming in late who also is going to add to it, who's a soft scientist, Al Spader. Um, uh-huh. he, he's just lagging a little. I just completely forgot he's coming on the show. I believe in transparency and honesty. And to oh, prove yeah. to all you podcasters that things aren't always perfect. Okay, <laughs> so just understand when he comes on, we're going to add him to the conversation. He is all right. about soft sciences. Cool. All, all right, right, cool. So kick us off, Michael. Sure. So, so this conversation came up because BC came and was one of our guest stars on the 100th anniversary show of Continuing Conversations. And somehow, I can't remember if it was while being recorded or whether it was while uh, off screen that, that we talked about the sciences. And, you know, Star Trek is definitely known for the hard science, sciences. But we cannot negate the fact that especially with TNG, with TNG, Deanna Troy coming on, the soft sciences really came in as counseling um, and psychotherapy and things like that. Okay, and we just so you know, we just had Al Spader join also. Al, just so you know where we're at, we made introductions, we're talking about soft sciences. I'm going to go ahead and interrupt myself so that Al, you can introduce yourself real quick and then we're going to jump back into it. All right. So, hey, Al Spader here. Um, I'm a contributing writer for Star Trek Adventures, and I'm excited to be on here. Okay, fantastic. So we were talking about how this conversation started, which again was BC talking about, you know, I really think that we should explore soft sciences. So I'm going to let BC, from your point of view, from your introduction, talk to me. Soft sciences. Why is this so interesting to you? 
Sure. So I think the comment jumped into my head at the time because we had been talking to Dr. Aaron and we were we were talking about, you know, some people feel apprehensive about playing the science officer because there's this expectation that there's going to be some crunchy, you know, hard science in there. And, you know, like she was really cool about saying, like, you don't have to be that nervous about it. You don't have to understand all the details. You can hand wave a lot. You can techno babble a lot, et cetera. Um, but that got to me that got me reflecting on the dynamics of my own campaigns and and in particular a, a, a friend and player in our our campaigns um, who plays the science officer in, in two different campaigns that I'm in um, consistently plays these soft science characters and it just occurred to me at the time that's kind of like oh that's so interesting that you know like that's the the focus that we're taking here and yet my personal experience with my my own campaigns is that the scientist is like the history major or the linguist or something like that um and and so that's just that's why that came up in my head at the time <laughs> good i think it's important for us for people who may not be in the know to define soft science right i think this is important like what does soft sciences mean what are some examples i'm going to pass it over to aaron paul Ye, only because i play with him so much in our rpg game for the last four or five years that mm -hmm. I know his character is very soft science based. So Aaron, or the audience, will you please define what we're talking about when we say soft science? I'll give my definition. Okay. So a hard science is the hard and dry facts about how the universe works. Soft science is how all of that affects you as a person hmm. and you as a person, how you interact with the world around you. That's my definition of the difference between hard and soft science and it, it might vary for other people but basically that's what it is okay i'm going to pass this off to jim then al also because i happen to know that both of these individuals work in soft sciences in some sense and i know i do also so so jim al how, what's your definition of soft sciences to give the audience kind of an idea yeah and this is only my definition like i'm sure there are professionals out there who would have very, very different opinions. But like, I, I always liken the hard sciences to where you need the math and the, and the, and the biology and the, and like the hard, really chemistry type of stuff. And then the soft sciences are like anthropology, archaeology, uh, sociology, uh, psychology, parapsychology, um, the, 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 like the, the hands-on interpersonal type of stuff more. So, I mean, I, certainly archaeology, you're, you're doing, you're doing stuff, but you don't, necessarily need quite as much hardcore science or mathematics or calculus or whatever to figure out the formulas and whatnot. Uh, so soft skill, soft sciences were always more the, the, the interpersonal people type of stuff. Uh, Al, what, what's your perspective? So the way I kind of look at it is hard scientists are a lot more quantitative uh, mm -hmm. in that we are doing observations, we are making measurements, we are you know, um, defining our hypotheses and doing tests to find them, whereas soft science is, is, is more um, qualitative, where we're making observations and, and, and making assumptions and making connections. Um, so that's kind of the difference between the two that I see. I love this. Okay, just so you all know, you're speaking my language. I'm, I want to actually go around the room in this time and kind of talk about our jobs, because I think people always think of scientists as beakers and electronics and diodes, and stuff like that. And I think it's important for us to, I, I, I'm really proud of this group. First of all, this group right here, I'd have on my starship any day of the week. And I think we could solve any problem if we had something as powerful as Enterprise or Voyager at our, at our, as our tool set, right? We agree that give us those tools and we can explore the universe too, sand Starfleet. So, and so I kind of one, one, real, real quick. One thing yeah. I would I, I meant to say that I forgot. Um, mm -hmm. If I want, if I were to liken soft skills and hard skill, you know, hard science and soft science to the to Star Trek Adventures, I would say your your hard science folks are using reason more often than not. And your soft science folks are using insight more Ooh. more often than not. That's that's my brain. That's where I'm at. Love it. Love that definition. Okay, this is rich now okay so let's go around the room real quick and talk about where we fall in the sciences because one of the interesting thing is all of us are scientists in our own realm of work which is which i'm just kind of aware of of knowing all of you so myself i work in mostly organizational development and people analytics, data analytics. So performance evaluation and talent development. So I'm looking at a lot of what um, Al said 
qualitative data in order to try to influence the workforce to achieve our strategic goals, which are very quantitative, meaning that we can figure out what our return on investment are and we know what our hard target numbers are. Interestingly enough, which I'm not going to side rail on a conversation with AI and many of these um, softwares that are developing now, qualitative is becoming quantitative only because our users are generating so much data using our systems that we can count how they act. And, and that's a whole nother subject, which we can mm. go down another time. So, so I'm, I'm in the soft sciences myself, uh, dealing with people in workforce management. Okay. Let's go around the table and kind of talk about where you fall as a scientist. Uh, BC, let's start with you. Sure. So I, I, I must confess, I'm apprehensive about describing myself as a scientist. Um, I'm a computer programmer by day. <laughs> uh, I was I, I went to university for mathematics, so I studied pure mathematics. Um, I don't view math as a science. It's it's a, a sort of a foundational <laughs> number theory stuff. <laughs> um, but I guess I, I don't view it as science because I don't really think of it as, you know, a data collecting and or experimentation oh. study. Um, uh, but you know, it is very numbers and very crunchy. <laughs> um, I just, I, 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 I think of computer programming and, and some people call, some people refer to it as computer science, but you know, I think it's more of a craft than it is a science. And so I'm apprehensive about using the term, um, science to describe computer programming. You know, I love that because my wife, who's a mathematician minor, she says that math is just proving fact, like, like it's not like the scientific method per se, mm -hmm. theoretical, Indeed. that, that when, once math is math, there's no arguing math. I, I remember having this conversation at one point with a, a scientist friend of mine, and, and we're talking about proof and like, you know, in math, proof means a very particular thing. It means, you know, like this is true and we know it to be true. And, and in science, it's like, no, you know, the statistics suggest that this is true. It's like, that's not proof. <laughs> Oh, wow. Okay. Thank you, VC. I, again, I could see where us going for hours on a non-RPG tangent on all of these because I love subjects like this, usually because I'm not the smartest person in the room when it comes to it. So I love listening to this. So, so thank you, BC. Uh, let's go over to Al. Al, where do you fall on the soft hard science? So, uh, so I'm a middle school science teacher. Mm -hmm. um, I work with sixth, seventh, eighth graders, um, teaching them earth science, biology, and um, mm -hmm. physics. And uh, we, one of our key things that we are teaching our kids is, you know, the difference between qualitative and quantitative data, right? Um, and trying to show them the differences and the things that you can do. And kind of like what you said, Michael, about uh, how can we take this, you know, th these observations that we make and make them quantitative um, and, and so on. So we do a lot of observations uh, and we do a lot of measurements and, um, you know, we try to link the two together whenever we, we possibly can. For lack of a better word, that's so hot. <laughs> It's so amazing. I love, I love when kids get into science too, because it really forms their personality. Like, oh, there is truth out there. The truth actually does exist. So that's, I love that. All right, Aaron. Well, um, I, I did my undergrad in, undergrad in astrophysics and then my grad in climate change studies. So all of my background is in the hard sciences, uh, but I uh, am an amateur historian. So like a lot of my hobbies revolve around history and therefore there's, I have a little bit of a, a soft science attachment there. Mm -hmm. I'm surprised you call yourself an amateur uh, historian because I spent two days with you in Indianapolis and you are like an amazing World War II historian and Russian history historian. I well, can't believe you call yourself an amateur. <laughs> I, I don't have a degree. So I, I that I doesn't say. matter. Don't let a piece of paper define how smart you are. Believe me. Mm -hmm. All right, Jim, over to you. What about you? Where do you fall? Uh, I think I'm very firmly into the, into the soft sciences. I think I was a liberal arts major. I got a degree in English, minor history, um, got into theater. I do a lot of Inter, I do a lot of interpersonal relationship stuff with uh, people. I mean, as a project manager for Star Trek, of course, I'm managing people every freaking day. Like it's it's hurting cat. It's, it's getting people to do things it, or not getting them to do it, but it's encouraging them to do things so that we reach a common goal. Um, so it's a lot of work with that. 
Uh, and then my day job, which I hardly ever talk about, but uh, I'm in, um, uh, I'm a sales enablement project manager. So still project management, still managing people, but um, I'm really focused there on being a mentor and an educator and, and learning how people do their job and then applying best practices to that and some training to help them do their job more effectively. So it's just even, it's not heavy duty, but it's like little tweaks, like little suggestions that I can give them. And if I see the light bulb go off and then they're suddenly more effective and we can measure that to some extent. Um, although we're still, you know, looking for the magic bullet of like, how do you train somebody to be a even better seller? Right. It's just, a, it, it, there's a lot <laughs> involved in that, but everything I do is, is very, very people focused, very interpersonal, um, very, um, deliberate patient conversations and, um, and just trying to get people to, to share knowledge and, uh, and, and insight so that I can reflect it back on them. We, I mean, amazing. I mean, this would be an amazing crew for any starship, right? Like we could all find a position on that bridge. So now we want to apply this to RPG. And really, again, the goal in us bringing this up is as players, we get asked all the time, like, what should my science officer do? Or, or what can I do with this anthropology or archaeology or sociology? Um, and, and so we really want to help you as um, players or G GMs, for GMs to be able to set up your players to highlight these soft science and get the most out of their game and for players to discuss with your GM like how can you invoke these these focuses or talents into your into your game um so pardon me so so let's talk about that for a little bit for GMs um I think everyone here GMs right BC nod your head because I think everybody else I think um and so what do you do to set up your players for success if they are soft science characters anthropology let's go with one of the most common ones that i notice in, in star trek adventures anthropologists archaeologists counselor ships counselor what do you do to set up your players for success to keep them engaged well I mean, it's it I, I, yeah uh it's easy for me because I'm also heavily focused on the soft sciences, right? So archaeology, languages, history, um, um, interpersonal communications and relationships, like that's all passions of mine anyway. And so I just go out, I, I, you know, I take the time to review the character sheet and whatever history or other material that the, that the player has created for me or for us collectively as a group to look at. And I just, I dig into it. I'll, I'll, I'll print it off. I'll highlight it. I'll make notes and I'll say, okay, this is what this player wants to explore. And this is what they say their character is good at. So I'm going to give them opportunities. I'll throw NPCs at them. I'll throw situations at them, uh, whether it's related to the actual mission at hand or not, uh, because presumably they're probably going to be a, um, a department head of some sort on the ship or station. And there's going to be a, a, a recurring cast of people that they're going to have to deal with. <laughs> and it may not be every episode, right? But I just want to I, I keep peppering them with opportunities just to see what sticks and what what resonates. And um I won't ever give up. Like if they, if if I if I try an NPC on them and there's just no connection there, it's like fine. They they can be moved off, and I'll bring in another one next time, just to see what happens. But uh, um, uh, archaeology, like I like to create, um, um, you know, interesting finds. I'll, I'll make up some interesting find that they can discover and be responsible for to, to do the research. Uh, if it's sociology, I'll just I'll just try to come up with other problems or solutions that they can get into as a character as like a B plot. Right. That doesn't have to be related to the main plot, but just give them cool stuff to focus on that's related to what their character is good at. Um, I, I just I love doing that kind of thing for my players. BC. Yeah. Uh, oh, go ahead. Out then BC. Oh, I was gonna say, um, there's two there's two things that um I think that uh are a really good ways to hook um these type of characters, and that is first of all, giving giving them a mystery. Uh, something that doesn't quite make sense that they have to piece together using their focuses um, that, uh, you know, revolve around their this type of study. Um, and the second thing is, you know, like Jim said, you know, about a B plot, maybe giving them, giving them an ongoing thing that they are studying. Maybe it's not something that they're going to solve in a single episode, right? Maybe this is just something that they get one scene on as you are progressing through, you know, a season or something like that, that they keep checking back to. Um, and I think that way there, you keep them interested with what they're really good at and what their focus is, um, even though it may or may not be directly tied to the story. Yeah, so in our campaign, uh, our campaign is um, mostly inspired by DS9. So they're on a station, um, there's a planet nearby, et cetera. Um, and one of the long-running 
campaign elements is this investigation that's going into this ancient society that they've discovered, you know, artifacts on the planet that suggest that there is a, an ancient civilization that has, has visited there in the past. And so our science officer is, is a linguist who has studied this particular ancient civilization that they know has existed, but haven't really known much about, um, and was assigned to the station specifically because of this particular um, background. And so like Al is describing, I think, you know, there's the central mystery that is not solved within the context of one particular adventure. Like they find a little bit here and then we do some other things and we find a little bit more over here and we go off and we do some other things. And just building on that has been really fun. And I think that it has really grabbed the player's attention. So that's, that's a one example of, you know, how to, how to make the most of, of, uh, of some, uh, science officers or, or soft science officers, I guess. Yeah. Can I ask when you're doing that, what rules are you engaging in from this STA system? Like what, what mechanics are you using to keep that exciting knowing that they could roll a failure basically is what I'm asking. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> so, I, I mean, we do a lot of research, <laughs> you know, long running research tasks and um, a, a lot of it has to do with like, uh, uh, they find a particular artifact or a, a particular structure or something like that. They have to figure out the, the the elements of that particular structure. And then usually in the course of of investigating that, that's given them a clue to a next particular thing. So that's less about, you know, the 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 rules or 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 what have you of, of the STA system and more about the construction of this sort of narrative and how the whole narrative fits together. Okay, so it's almost like maybe a long multi-game exactly. linear gated yeah. challenge kind of thing. And, yeah, in the interest of transparency, I've I've stolen bits from the Tilakal saga. And... <laughs> <laughs> That's what you're supposed to do. It's all it's all ingredients. It's all exactly. ingredients for your own wonderful concoction. That's what it's there for. Exactly. All right, Aaron, uh, I'm looking forward to hear your take because your character, I know in our game, has had the most interesting soft to hard science evolution and integration of both. So what about what keeps your character engaged or players well, engaged? I think that I still consider him a soft scientist, even though he's like the science officer on the ship, which is which is a very strange position to be in. Yes, he does have like one hard science on as a focus, and that's but it's a very niche one. Regardless, I I it, like I defined to me what soft science is. It's when I can find a way to link a discovery or a piece of hard science into how it affects either the crew himself or the environment like other the other civilizations where you can apply what it means like hey i found a ruin let's say and we can find out that it's x amount of years old um and there's doorways in it well he would approach it as i will tell you everything i can figure out about the people that built this ruin by the shape of the door because i'm seeing how it interacts with what a life form would be and then what makes it useful to them as a person so like if the door is square shaped it means they're probably upright and generally symmetrical and taller than they are, you know, <laughs> wide. But if you have a strange looking door, why are all the doors perfectly round and have, have irises? Do they float? Are they like cylindrical beings? Do you know? I, you, you I, see what I, I'm I, I, I know I, w I wish, because there's too much to talk about with how many episodes of USS Pioneer you played, mm -hmm. where honestly, if I ever get the chance to write a comic or a novel for Star Trek, I'm leading with a soft science character as the chief science officer because it, it exposed an entirely new vantage point to the game that blew my mind. When you took your person from being the chief counselor to stepping into the chief science officer position, and Al can detest to this, he's, I'd love to hear his commentary on this uh, since he's our XO. It changed how I write as a game master based off how you interact with the characters when you first meet them. It's always not the first hard science solution. It's what's behind this, including for like major cosmic phenomenon. He thinks there's a psychology behind it. 
like how the universe mm-hmm. is programmed and how the universe thinks. It's mm-hmm. become his own talent called uh, something grand of the mole. theory of the mole. Grand theory of the mole. Yeah, and and so and so um, that was my point. So if you or Al want to talk about that, I think I want. I really wish players they could always read all of our adventures and experience your character, Commander Nalanid. He's a Tellerite. But if you want to add to that, because I really want people and players and GMs to understand where you could take it, what your motivation was behind that Al's observations of your character. Yeah. Go, go Al first. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, uh, it's very cool tackling a situation from um, maybe uh, someone that we haven't met yet's mindset. Right. And if we can get ourselves into that mindset, it allows us to do our jobs as, you know, uh, officers on a starship um, in a way that, we can be as sensitive to the culture as possible, right? Um, because remember, yeah, so we might have ruins that we're trying to identify, but we also might be interacting with a culture that is just completely different than ours, that values different things, that acts differently. Um, and to have a character on board that can get us prepared for what their what that mindset is like um, keeps us from, you know, stepping on toes and, and, and um, doing some stuff that could, you know, blow back on us uh, in the future. So having that type of character on board is is really, uh, you know, a, a boon. Like it's exciting um, to have so that we can go from that direction. Yeah, there, there's a, in fact, I'll, I'll, because it's in the Shackleton Expanse guidebook, there's a module called Bacchus Irresistible Call, I think it was. Um, and we, pl- we play in the TNG area. And so when we ended up back in time, for Bacchus Irresistible Call, I remember that Aaron's character was dealing with the psychology of Romulans at that time and also the Federation at that time in order to inform how they should survive this time debacle. And it was just interesting the way that was tackled. That that was an approach I wasn't expecting in the game, and it ended up working out really well, um, the conversations they had. So I, I loved how you described that, Al. Mm. Yeah. Any other input? Um, when I talk about soft science too, I have to ask everyone, would that include diplomacy? Mm -hmm. B, I I would say, yes, it does because that's interacting. That's taking rules of like rules that are set out as norms, let's say, and trying to apply it to a situation that involves people and people are generally unpredictable or might have, generally i say but they might have unexpected reactions to certain things so diplomacy is all about applying rules into a new situation that involve people and differing morals and ethics my, yeah, I, my, i'd even i'd even extend that to say you know your your diplomats your negotiators uh there's probably certain flavors of intelligence officers that would probably be a good uh chief science officer you wouldn't expect it necessarily but uh um people who are who are good at um like criminal psychology and um and and maybe not so much on the forensic side of things but just like getting into the mindset of a, of a criminal like how are they thinking what are they doing i could i could see that being an interesting um science officer that would be a very different spin it'd be more like um Odo being your science officer instead of your chief of security, <laughs> right? Uh, it's just it's just a different application of that skill set. A point that uh, my my player, who's the science officer, had made was that at some level you have to think of the science officer also as being the head of the science department, and and that's a managerial position and requires you to understand people and how to interact with people and mm-hmm. and what have you, and and. So as a result, like it seems to make a whole lot of sense that you want somebody with some some soft sciences in there. And it makes me think back to like episodes like the Galileo seven, where the fundamental issue is like Spock doesn't have the people skills (laughs) because he's the science officer that thinks in logic and numbers, et cetera. And and that's what could create the conflict of that particular episode. (laughs) I mean, the fact that they're trapped on a planet with giant spirit throwing monsters but whatever (laughs) i I was i was actually going to say something just like that for my science officer in that he has like he's very psychology and diplomacy oriented and as the chief science officer he runs the science department Mm -hmm. and he does so by team building and putting members of the science division together that he knows will work well together 
Like mm-hmm. he understands how these people tick. He's talked to them, some of them while he was um, the, the, the ship's counselor, but most afterwards. And he's the one that went out when um, our ship was back at earth. He was the one that went out and convinced everybody that he wanted back on the team to come back onto the team for the science division, because he's the diplomat. He's the psychologist. He knows what he needs to do as a people person, which mm-hmm. seems odd for a Tellerite again, but he's a people person. Yeah, I don't remember. Uh, I, I know it was in one of the books. I don't remember which one now, but somewhere along the way, I know we wrote up some information about how, you know, if you're the chief science officer, you're not just on the bridge doing all the science stuff like Spock, right? Or, or like you're not on ops all the time doing the DAX thing. You are, in fact, the dean of faculty on your ship, right? Or on your station. And because you might have dozens of of civilian scientists on the ship and you might have dozens of starfleet scientists and other scientists and 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 i I think about like um i think about nasa when they were running the shuttle program you would have mission specialists and you would have like payload specialists on the ship and they would rotate you might only ever get one shot at the at a a space at a shuttle mission but you were there specifically to do science on specific experiments or something and somebody was in charge of all that right somebody was in charge of that stuff in addition to their own research and so you know if you're a, if you're on a you know i don't know like a luna class ship and you're the head you're the chief of sciences you might be responsible for managing 50 to 100 people i don't remember what book we talked about this in was it lower decks or was it science i can't remember um aaron um one of you maybe al even maybe you even wrote some of this in the player's guide i just I don't think remember. i mentioned i, I know we've science. talked around this a little bit um i don't know maybe someday we'll have to do a series of uh pdf supplements for each key department head or something i don't know <laughs> uh but uh but the, and i think you know it may have been one of our um many videos michael where we talked about a deep dive into science and what can you do with your science officer that you may not have thought of before and it's like well this is a great opportunity remember that they are in charge of the entire science department on the ship or station and that they'll have to deal with a lot of interpersonal relationships with people who aren't even in the chain of command right yeah how does, how does that how does that change the dynamic well, I got to ask a question just for Starfleet nerdiness to ask. Can the chief science officer also be the head of chief medical, be the head of the medical staff too? Because we know it's the sciences division. So it, it, is it possible that medical reports to science in some sort of hierarchy? Hmm, that's a good question. I would think that medical would, it would be a part of, of the science division. But again, the chief medical officer is outside of the normal chain of command. Right. So like, yes, asterisk. Yeah, because they, but they kind of have this dotted line to the captain. Right. At that point, because they could always say he's, they, why did I say he slapped me in the face? This is 2023. That they are, I've got to get rid of these reflex reactions. That the captain could definitely be removed from duty from the CMO, right? So we know that that's, that's possible. Cool. Okay. Then I have a question because we talked about, about diplomacy as a chief, as a potential chief science officer in some sort of negotiation. What about interrogation? Yes. <laughs> yes i mean it's the same kind of thing because you're trying to understand somebody so that's a soft science interrogation is like psychology you're trying to understand somebody i think we've even touched on that in our game a bit mm-hmm. with nolan being the psychologist and being the person that can really kind of get into people's heads mm-hmm. and then and then it blurs the line a little bit when you move into more like physical interrogation and you, you get into you know um not to say torture but but like more aggressive interrogation techniques that that a, a more cardassian mental like <laughs> mental brain um kind of like like uh i mean hannibal lecter clearly on one side of the spectrum but then you get like um the smoking man right really more on the other side of it where it's all it's all mind games what about mirror universe garrick you know i was thinking yeah. about that right Al, you're think Al's twisting it. Al's twisting his beard. I know he's, he's only <laughs> conniving. What are you thinking? Well, well, I, I mean, I we are definitely framing this through a science officer lens, right? Um, but that doesn't. Uh, you can have soft science skills 
and not be the science officer, right? So I'm thinking that like security, um, you know, could have a lot of those soft sciences embedded in, right? Um, I'm thinking like, like, what if um, they were a political science uh, major, and they were in, you know, in charge of, you know, setting up whenever uh, the president walks through um, an area or something like that, you know what I mean? So I think that like, you could see these um, soft scientists spill into uh, all, all, all of the other um, positions on the shift. Um, and, and, you know, I think that you can do the same type of storytelling um, with all characters that have these uh, little nuggets of um, focuses, uh, as opposed to, you know, it doesn't have to be a science officer, even though, you know, that's the lens that we're kind of looking at it through. Think, think about this for a security officer. They have history. That's soft science. And, oh, look, I've seen this battle before. I, I can recognize what is happening in front of us, how they're setting this up, how, how the opponents are setting it up, whoever's attacking us. And I know I've seen this before, so I know how to set up a good defense. Like that's just just one way of putting even history into security. The reason I like hearing that, and again, we'll go around and talk about what I'm about to introduce, is we're learning now that with soft science, and especially with Jim said, using insight instead of reason, that you have a lot of different ways to get information out of people. So Quark with bartending or Neelix with cooking. Okay, so I want really players to think about this. If you have, what, why not take on these skills? Because to me, it makes the role-playing experience a little bit more interesting, whereas opposed to you having Tuvok go in with interrogation, that you have Neelix go in with cooking to still tackle the same problem because it's a roll of the dice in the end. Let's discuss this when it comes to soft sciences. What are you thinking, BC? Yeah, I, I mean, I think a, a central question that jumps into my head or a central thought that jumps into my head is, um, at some level, games that are oriented towards character interaction, those things work a whole lot better in. You know, some people are a bit more dice rolly and <laughs> fight the monster, <laughs> pew pew, et cetera. Um, and maybe those ones are harder to, to get those elements out of. But I think that, you know, those sort of narrativist games that, <laughs> you know, you can definitely... Uh, use all of those skills at the table and, <laughs> and and have these wonderful character moments. I think that, you know, part of the reason why our, our science officer works is because we tend to have a real character heavy sort of story that, that, that emerges. So yes, I, I think that you're right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we're trying to encourage our players to write, right? And to show why they're special. So even if you're into basket weaving and you decide to, while being tortured by Klingons or captured by Klingons to ask for basket stuff and find a creative way to get that basket weaving, to get intelligence out of a Klingon. To me, that's a story I want to see, not just to fight your way out of a Klingon prison, right? <laughs> the game in which I'm a player, um, our, <laughs> the science officer is a historian and one of his focuses is in watercolor because he taught watercolor at Starfleet Academy. <laughs> and then we had a, an adventure where he actually got to use his watercolor to analyze the cave paintings, et cetera, and, and draw some conclusions. It was just such a wonderful uh, little moment. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> That's the Star Trek adventures on that. Yeah, I, I think I think we see lots of examples of that throughout the whole, all the different series, right? Uh, the first one that springs to mind is uh, an early DS9 episode where Kira has to go to a Bajoran moon and get all the inhabitants off the moon. And there's one old guy, one irascible old guy who refuses to leave because he's got a kiln to build and he doesn't yeah. want it, anything to do with it. And so she's she go, she takes it upon herself to build that thing, but that actually ends up being a metaphor for other things that are happening. And, and man, when you can make that work in an episode or, or in, in a session with a group of players or something, it's just magical. And that's something that um, I just don't see un much of in other RPGs. Uh, I think I think Star Trek is, I don't want to say it's uniquely suited for that, but it's just so well focused on it because the people and the interrelationships and stuff are so important to, to what Star Trek is, right? I mean, even more so than like the hard sciences. The hard sciences are great, but it's always the people solving the problem at the end and yeah, at, the, at the end of the episode. Um, so it's just it's, it's just fascinating to 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 hear that BC. Thank you for bringing that up. 
so now this is actually fun because I think we have the responsibility to give people soft science episodes to watch as reference to showing how you can have an amazing show or amazing game. So I'm going to go to my number one TNG episode. It's my favorite episode of all time. And I, this is, I'll go slow. So you all have time to mull over what your favorite soft science skill episode is, but I'm definitely going to push for TNG inner light. So I'm going to talk about what that premise is for those who haven't watched it, rush back and watch it. Inner light is about a probe from a dead civilization. Sorry for the spoiler. Deal with it because I want to show how this was one of the most epic episodes of all time. So a probe from an ancient civilization, the Enterprise comes upon it. It shoots a beam of weird energy, knocks out Picard for 20 minutes. Yet in those 20 minutes, he lives a lifetime on a planet that sent the probe to record its demise because of ecological destruction. And, and it's a lesson learned in the way they want to memorialize their people from an anthropological point of view was to hope that this would pass on to another intelligent civilization so they wouldn't make the same mistakes. But that's not where inner light ends. Anyone who knows is later in the series, it comes back where Picard falls in love with a woman and he's playing the song on his flute that he had somehow been transported from the probe onto the ship. And he has his flute in this song, his previous life played. And it becomes a musical episode, which to me is science. I believe music is science, mathematics in the most creative form in the universe. Um, and it became a second episode, which became an amazing plot and a romantic story. And to me, that was like one of the most amazing, provocative Star Trek stories I've ever seen because there's no pew pew, there's no fighting. It's pure soft science from music to anthropology. And the message was so clear. That's my favorite soft science episode. So, so I uh, hopefully no one emulates that here. But when you all think about your favorite soft science episode to show how epic a story can be, what would you pick? Go in any order that you want. I, I have one piece of the action. It's all about diplomacy and figuring out how these people work. So psychology and, and anthropology. Tell us about this. it. I need to know what, what, what okay, show. So, so the Give entire episode is that uh, it's from TOS. They visit a planet, Sigma Iosha. I'm trying to remember all the details here. And that planet was originally visited back pre-Federation by a human ship, and they left behind a book that was Chicago Gangs of the 1920s. And this, this civilization emulated everything they found in that. I firmly believe there was more than just that one book left because they they accurately emulated uh, well they accurately copied both cars, Tommy guns, and and uh, the fashion of the. Right. How would they have known that? Right? How would they have known that without diagrams? So so, it, there, there was cultural contamination. But when yeah. Kirk, Spock, Bones, all everybody visits, it's all just a kleptocracy running the 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 planet in all these little kind of gangs everything is just split up into all these little gang lands and they're having to figure out how to get these people to start working together that hey wait humans screwed this up we need yeah. to really fix this in some sort of way how are we best going to fix this oh well we need to we need to sort of portray the federation as maybe the bigger gang <laughs> yes. and they're gonna keep the peace and they need their piece of the action when it's all said and done and then mccoy leaves behind a communicator and screws Ep things up further well epic choice by the way aaron and I, and I don't know if you followed it or not but did you follow up with jackson lansing and colin kelly's continuation of that story in star trek year five no oh i haven't, I haven't. please you you'll love it even more they took it even further great soft science um mm -hmm. explanation uh, 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 uh selection there that was a good one wow i didn't even think about that who else what's your favorite so uh so i don't have uh an episode that i'm going to call out but i do want to call out one particular scene and it's a scene that gets kind of scrutinized um and it's when uh in the vulcan hello when michael burnham uh you know commands the shenzhou to fire on 
the Klingons, right? Mm-hmm. We haven't seen Klingons for a hundred years. Um, they're almost like an afterthought. A lot of the people on here clearly don't know a lot about the culture uh, and so on. And, you know, Burnham, uh, using her anthropology roots, um, says, no, they they respect power. We need to do this. And um, by hesitating and not doing so, they basically started a war. Ooh, that's a good example. Oh, God, that's a good example. I would never have thought of that. Your, oh. your mention of the of the inner light got me thinking about a couple of episodes that are thematically similar. I, I don't think they're necessarily always as strong as the, the inner light, but uh, but I think they're thematically similar. So the one is the I forget the title of it, but it's the episode of Deep Space Nine where O'Brien goes to prison and has like um, the experiences of prison embedded into his memory. And you know, at first blush, I wouldn't have necessarily pointed to this as a as a science episode, but except that clearly the people who decided that this was a punishment, like must have arrived at that conclusion based on some sort of analysis of the situation. And, and the, the way that we get to see the effects of that, I think are, are, are really quite eye opening. Like it, it, it gives, it presents the experience of being incarcerated in a way that, you know, forces us to take a fresh look at that. Right. I think that's, you I think know, that's hard time. Time. It's best. <laughs> I'm going to have to rewatch that one now. <laughs> that was a, that was hard time. And that's a fascinating mm. episode because of how far O'Brien is willing to go right at the end. And yeah. then you've got, and then you got some serious soft skills, soft sciences at the very end when Bashir talks them down. Uh, so there's, there's a, there's a lot of great stuff in that BC. Good stuff. Yeah. What was, your, what was then, your other one? The other example is Memorial. Again, not always as successful an episode in my opinion, but, but I, it's a Voyager episode in which um, an away team comes back from a, a, a an away mission, and they're all having these like memories of of yes. having done something bad. They're, ha- they're experiencing post traumatic stress disorder, basically, yes. and and they're trying to figure out like why are they having that, and they discover that you know some culture had had like this horrific battle, and they thought this can't go unmarked. We have to like we have to acknowledge that this happened in a way that you know make other people really feel it and understand what Mm -hmm. took place and again like not something i would have immediately pointed to and said this is a a science episode (laughs) you know it it felt more philosophical but but it's 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 imbued with all of this sort of soft science decision making that led to the particular position that those characters were in yeah, I want to thank you for that, BC, because I remember I saw that episode in or around the time I first experienced the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C., and I remember I made an instant connection about why it's so important to not forget stuff like that. And I remember I, 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 I had gone with friends, and I'm the type who reads everything in a museum, so it was where they had gone through in two hours, I had been in there five hours. They were actually mad at me because they thought I was lost. They didn't know where I was, and we didn't have cell phones back then. <laughs> you know, and, and I just want to say that that episode I remember hit me so hard because it showed me why I need to take like my nieces and nephews to see this stuff. That is an amazing soft skill choice on that one for an episode. Thank you. Wow. Yeah. See, this is what this is why I love Star Trek, right? We just we just talked about six episodes, and it's like I want to go watch all of them. And I, I you know, I just, I just I wish I had time to do all the work I have to do, plus watch Star Trek all day long. It would be great. But what's uh, yours, Jim? What's your uh, soft skill choice? There are, there are so many, and I and I was just listening to you all, and I was just like, oh, I could do this one, or I could do this one, I could do this one. There there are so many great episodes that involve soft sciences and soft skills. Um, <laughs> It's going to sound like a dodge, but I think I want to really call call up uh, in the pale moonlight um, because that is there is so much soft science in there. You may not no- notice it, but like once Garrick understands what Cisco's trying to do and knows that Cisco can't just cannot do certain things. He takes it upon himself to convince certain people to do certain things. He takes certain actions upon himself, but there's this whole psychological through line to it. Totally. Just go trying to keep the, keep on just the right side of, of the law, but knowing that he's going down a path and uh, it's just fascinating as a psychological kind of, kind of story on a drama. But uh, again, I, I feel like that's kind of the safe choice. There's so many other great options out there, but in the pale moonlight, I think is, is a really powerful episode because it shows you uh you know through through soft skills how far people are willing to go 
for for really really good reasons or maybe not great reasons but you know it's it just really fascinating stuff yeah and we mentioned a lot that are morose morose or sad but i also want to focus too that soft skills can also be as amazing as luaxana troy episodes oh, yeah. when it comes to diplomacy and cultural integration and cultural studies like uh, people may think that those are funny episodes but if you really look at the brilliance that is Luaxana Troy as a character and that kind of diplomat in the federation like that I prefer a way to play an episode like that than a big sad episode and so there's a lot of fun you can have with soft sciences too psychology using humor appropriately um uh, courting rituals which again is a study of anthropology right is how people get together so there's a lot of ways you could play that in the game. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe we even, should. Uh, oh, even, I had the, one, uh, oh, go ahead now. I, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I had I had one more uh, idea in general that we haven't really touched upon. And that's philosophy as mm -hmm. a soft science. Well, I mean, we have we've mentioned it, but like as measure of a man, because that's mm -hmm. all the philosophy of what it means to be alive or what it means to be a person. And that entire episode centers around that idea. Yeah, that's all I wanted to add. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's, I mean, there's another ahead. episode to throw out, which is the is the Voyager episode in one of the later seasons. Again, an episode that not a lot of people re refer to, but it's the episode in which how is it? Is it Seven that originally gets trapped in this field that some society has put around a pre literate society on a particular planet, and when the people who live on the other parts of the planet discover that there's actually a way through this field, they're like, we want to go in there. And, and Chakotay and Seven have to wrestle with this question of like, somebody wanted to protect this society from outsiders. Mm -hmm. Should we like leave that intact? Or mm -hmm. <laughs> should we have like <laughs> cultural contamination? Good Seven, point. The prime directive is a very exactly. soft science subject, right? Exactly. Because you're and, looking at quantitative or sorry, qualitative data on a lot of that. Yeah, I think that, you know, it is the part of what works for me about that episode, even though, like I said, not a lot of people remember it or point to it as one of the best, um, is that it's really informed by, you know, our our understanding of, of our anthropological history and our our history with, you know, contacting uh, other cultures, et cetera. Yeah. I mean, you're waking some good stuff up here because honestly, Strange New Worlds um, Ad Astra per Aspera. Woo! That cooked the books <laughs> as most recent Star oh, Trek yeah. that I've watched three times at one episode. Again, the argument made there with what we see going on sociologically, if you want to talk about socioeconomic, sociopolitics, we're seeing some, um, that was an amazing courtroom scene where that was all soft science, if you think about it, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it has me thinking that like this has kind of been embedded in Trek forever, right? It's right in the mantra seek out new life and new civilizations, right? Mm -hmm. And all of that is about people uh, and interactions with people. And I think that's where a lot of these softer sciences really shine. From a game, okay, go ahead, Jim. I was just gonna say, I thought we, I think we saw an, another great example of that with the uh, Strange New Worlds, uh, you know, Subspace Rhapsody. Um, <laughs> Especially with uh, Uhura bringing the whole crew together at the end for the the big finale, right? Because yeah. it's it's all about people, it's all about connections, it's all about you know relationships being together, and uh, uh, that was a you know very strong soft sciences type of episode. Yeah. So and, and another example that you can do literally anything with Star Trek, any genre, any flavor you want, you can you can make it work somehow. Yeah, I really want to challenge game masters out there because, um, you know, I've learned it over years of playing again, being having the privilege to play with Al and Aaron and have them had their game mastering and playing genius to, to how they want stories told to look at a module or a mission brief and ask the question, what's the social issue here? What's the human issue? What's going on comparatively nowadays? And try to turn those reason feats into insight feats and see what you know, tasks and, and say, I went back to Marvel RPG with feats. Uh, so, so, you know, turn them into tasks. Um, and, and really to me, that's where our games get good is where we're talking about what could be. And if we try this, how people might react, that's not hard science. We know as 
BC, we were talking earlier, I'm not sure if it was before or after we started recording, but mathematics is about proofs, meaning you can't argue proofs. Like you move toward the sun at this speed and you don't have enough pull away velocity, you are dead. There is no way to argue this, you know, um, that's proofs. And so we're talking about introducing into the game the, the what ifs that create the dialogue that actually when we watch our most favorite Star Treks, it's usually the what ifs and those social conundrums that keep us riveted, right? Yeah. yeah. Everyone's it, well, I think what you're saying is different than I thought I had just been having, and I'm trying to reconcile those, those in Please. my head. Uh, somebody had said in passing, I wish I could remember who it was that said this, but I, I really enjoyed it. They said, the essence of Star Trek is having a philosophical conversation while you're in the middle of a phaser fight. And I thought, okay, like, okay, a little reductive, but I think there's a, a kernel of truth to that. Um, and so the ethical conversation is slightly different than what you're talking about, which is the sort of uh, speculative conversation. Like, I think you have to have both the speculative and the ethical <laughs> element of it that go hand in hand to, to like really that. make the, the, the compelling story, I think. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. That makes me remind that now that sounds like measure of a man kind of conversation. Mm -hmm. They're like, you are an android, but still, do you have rights? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I, I think I want to add, um, oh. you know, for those who are watching and listening and wondering how, how can I apply any of this to Captain's Log instead of instead of Star Trek Adventures? Maybe I'm maybe I'm playing Captain's Log by myself. I want to play a science officer, but I don't know anything about hard sciences. You know, uh, um, chemistry gives me hives. I'm terrified of math. You know, that kind of stuff. It's like, look, play, play a diplomat, play a play play a play a uh, intelligence officer who loves to solve mysteries who loves to take disparate pieces and pull them together play uh, you know play play an archaeologist play an anthropologist and just tell different kinds of stories than what you normally see and just focus on focus on the soft skills or soft sciences and uh, and have fun with it I, I i don't see i don't think there's anything that we've talked about tonight that couldn't be ported over to the captain's log without hesitation right you don't necessarily need other players to bounce off although it's certainly great to do that but you could easily do this all as a solo rpg or maybe a you know two person or three person or something like that so uh for those who are looking for the crossover um appeal of our episodes and in our content you know you can do a lot with this well jim i know we've challenged ourselves in our collaborative play to see if we could run a captain's log without any phasers or ship battles yeah. and we introduced our own of our own making um random tables that have to do with more with family drama and b stories and we've had some exciting episodes people will see them come up later but yeah. and and you know before this episode airs and after this episode but we've been kind of riveted by those social issues mm -hmm. in 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 ours dealing with politics and stuff like that so um yeah i i i like that you're all talking science in a non uh hard science way you know that, that there's this option out there uh it, it, let's get some final words on this subject al and let's go around the room yeah i mean um you threw out a challenge for game masters i'm gonna throw one out as well um i know that we we like to focus on the species that we know and love like we love talking about the romulans we love talking about the klingons and you know the andorians and whatnot there is literally hundreds of species that have appeared once on star trek that you could bring in create a society for that's different than ours to give your soft science characters uh something uh to interact with um in the game master guide there's this often overlooked chapter on page 238 that aaron and i both worked on uh called uh, new lives and new civilization and it talks about types of governments uh groupings of polities types of religions so types of societies like bring those in and create a, a new society that is different from ours that your character your characters have to reconcile the differences between and that's where you really start uh falling back on those soft science skills love it i also want to add into that supplement the lower deck supplement because the chapter about second contact missions it talks about diplomatic relations establishing scientific relations establishing um uh, uh cultural uh, first contact that there's so many soft sciences laid in that okay you're there 
kind of lower deck style, of course, like the TV show is you, you've met these people. There's no war going on, but there's a lot of other subcultural issues to deal with. Um, so if you need fuel for campaigns, paragraph after paragraph was written. I know when I had to work on that paragraph, one of my goals was can every sentence be its own encounter uh, as I write it to give people fuel to be like, wow, I can have an exciting game just figuring out what these people's monetary system is or courting rituals are, you know? So yeah, that those, both those uh, books could help with that. All right, Aaron, what are your final words of advice on this? Take whatever scientific discovery you want and then think about how it applies to me or to someone else or how it will affect the future. And that's, that's grist for your character to then philosophize or to apply soft sciences to that and add to the story because then they can think about the sociological impacts of it. Can you give us an example? Um, you discover a new form of energy and boy, it is going to make things much easier for warp, warp travel, but it might bring back the whole destruction of subspace thing. You know, what's the what's the benefit drawback of that? Is it going to be good for society in limited amounts? Should we completely ban it? That that just that sort of idea. That's cool. So a game master comes up with a new technology, creates some sort of side effect that creates a sociological issue. It that. doesn't even need to have a, a a very clear side effect. It can just be you can have your characters talk about it, how it affects Starfleet, what will change, how our jobs will change, how our interactions with others will change because of this. Mm -hmm. Hey, if I fire a photon torpedo, what does it mean mm -hmm. if I fire the photon torpedo? Because it might show other people that we're willing to use force and we're willing to use antimatter at that, which is actually a pretty terrifying thing. I, I like that. I mean, I, to me, I love something so, so simple where it's kind of like, by the way, this new civilization I've created, if you fire a, not phasers, but if you fire photon torpedoes, they view it as all out war and don't explain why that's just the way they feel and see yeah. if the players can work around that. And figure. I love that. I love that. Okay. That's psychology. Yeah. You see, you brought up this wonderful <laughs> subject. So glad you did give it to us. Yeah, so I mean, I kind of feel like what I'm about to say is like really trivial. <laughs> Star Trek, I think, is fundamentally a, a a vehicle for telling these morality stories about the things that are going on in our real world. And I think that the the genius of it is to be able to say, okay, let's create this thing that can operate as the metaphor. It's a society, or it's a problem, or it's a a whatever <laughs> um, that can you know personify some metaphor. <laughs> that is, a, you know, <laughs> current and on people's minds and, and what have you, but show it in a new way that allows us to see that sort of conversation in a new light. And I think that that goes back to uh, the topic about, about speculation. So I think Spider Robinson is the first person I heard say this directly, but he, he talks about three forms of speculation. The what if, the, you know, if this goes on, and I've forgotten the third one, <laughs> um, but, you know, those those speculations are ways of of looking at what we have in today's world <laughs> and you know trying to say if i take that to an extreme or take that you know much farther than where it is right now like what are the implications that come out of that and i think that those those stories are are what we <laughs> stories that are informed by that process are almost certainly going to come out feeling like a star trek story and i think that's really cool <laughs> Yeah, it blows my mind, you know, as we talk about this and Jim, as we've done so many episodes and we, we're, it seems to me like our, our episodes keep leaning more into a tutorial and masterclass about storytelling, even though we're an RPG show, right? That, that, that we get into this in such a beautiful way to show the richness and nuance of RPG. Um, Jim, any final words before we start going to our gratitude moment i know i have a lot to be thankful yeah for. well I, I just to reflect on what you just said michael i think i think that might be one of the not to use the phrase but it, that might be one of the differentiators for star trek versus other rpgs is that it is science fiction it is based on a narrative heavy ip right i mean it's it's very storytelling focused it's very character focused 
And that's something that a lot of RPGs just don't have, right? Because Star Trek's not built on a foundation of tactical combat, right? I mean, not to poke at any other game systems or anything, but like Star Trek has always been narrative because that's where it's a TV show, right? So it's always been narrative. And I think, I think Star Trek Adventures, I think Nathan did an amazing job, Nathan Dowdell, of, of translating the 2D20 system to create that opportunity for that heavy narrative in a game environment that you don't see in a lot of other games, right? So I think I think just by its very nature, Star Trek really leans, Star Trek Adventures really leans into that narrative focus. And I think it, it totally makes sense for us that we're teaching game masters and players to be thinking that way. Mm-hmm. Get, get out of the mindset that you're focused on killing and looting and and going for the xp it, it, like there's so much more rich stuff that you can play with right uh so i i won't go into that soap, soapbox though um i think anything else i was going to say i think uh, bc really kind of covered what i was going to get at and that was just to remind game masters and players that um star trek is a science fiction setting which means that you can take modern day problems which a lot of our modern day problems are very soft skills very soft science you know it's it's politics it's uh, a body autonomy it's it's uh uh sociological skills mm-hmm. it's interpersonal skills i mean there's just so much that you can take and you know certainly have that session zero with your group to see what what they're comfortable exploring or not exploring in a game environment and then be willing to um, not to not to dismiss it, but be willing to dress it up in such a way that it's not quite so in your face. Right. It's not it's not the humans having this problem. It's the Vulcans or it's the Tellarites or it's the Andorians or, you know, just if you if you put a, or, or it's a new alien species. Right. That's having this horrible problem. And and, um, you know, and then you can kind of you know, cast a light on it. So, yeah, uh, I, I, I want to just add to that because. I love games where you learn. Every, anyone who's watched the shows knows, knows that my work, I take a lead on the learning division, which I focus on gamification because I believe humans learn the best when they're playing, right? So which is probably why I lean toward RPG so much and really trying to make the games provocative and walk away. And they're like, oh, I learned something. And I, and I just invite people, if you have, you know, look at the group of scientists we literally have sitting here on this podcast right now. You don't need a degree to have us be a scientist, by the way. I just want you all to be clear. I'm very clear on this. You can study science and not need a degree and be better than other people, right? So I'm big pro on that um uh so so you could incorporate into this game the sciences you're interested in whether it be soft or hard science or engineering or whatever this is a you can make rpg a steam class you know science technology electronics art and mathematics you could do this if that gets your group going we i mean we consistently have on this show real phd people who play star trek and and we know that a lot of the big scientists out there are pro star trek because it advances human thinking so conversations like this to me are just like blowing my mind it makes me like we're not just playing we're learning at the same time so to jim's point you could bring in these topics and actually in the game and be more mature at the end of it which to me is like what other game offers that it's just crazy right yep yep preach it bro (laughs) all right no i mean it just gets me going like because kids i mean many i know some people here have children or either teach children and stuff like that and we know that the some of the best games are when kids are playing and learning at the same time and they don't even know it Mm -hmm. that's to me is just like the greatest thing ever because then you teach people to have this hunger for learning so i mean that could be a whole nother episode about creating a hunger for learning through gaming uh which would be fun to do but I think we can move to gratitude now. I'll, I'll lead it off and then we'll go around and end with Jim. Um, I'm going to give gratitude to Delta Flyers. If For those of you who don't know Delta Flyers, um, Bobby Duncan, Robbie Duncan McNeil, who played uh, uh, Lieutenant Paris on Star Trek Voyager, and Garrett Wong, who played Instant Kim, uh, the Forever Instant, um, they have a show called a podcast, which I encourage people to listen to, which is called Delta Flyers. And just recently, just starting yesterday, uh, this is December. December 4th. So they started this on December 3rd. Um, they invited uh, uh, two actors from Deep Space Nine to become regulars on their show. So they have um, Armin and I give me the names. You're the Deep Space Nine person, Jim. So Dax and Quark. 
Oh, Terry Farrell and Armin Shimmerman. They've wow. joined their show and it's starting yesterday. They've started doing a play by play episode by episode of Deep Space Nine. So they finished all seven years of Voyagers, which was for me as a Voyager fan, the best thing to ever listen to. I'm an, I was an admiral for, uh, for, for, from 2020 on, um, had a chance to talk with them, have monthly meetings. They have an amazing podcast where they talk with you and uh, correspond with you. So now because they finished that and the SAG strikes are over they've started the deep space nine weekly watch and so now um my wife who's never watched deep space nine every episode she's because she watched she listened to the delta flyers podcast for the voyager episode she's a voyager fan so now we're starting deep space nine so i'm getting easter egg after easter egg i started with episode one last night with the wife um and so i just really want to thank and give my gratitude to uh bobby duncan mcdill and garrett wong who who are continuing the passion, creating new fans, and now they're expanding into the Deep Space Nine right. universe. Oh, you're going to drag me into this. Oh, dude, it's amazing. Is it, is it, is it, is it weekly or daily? Weekly. Every weekly. Sunday, they'll have a new episode. And already what I learned, I'm, I'm only 15 minutes into the first. So what I do is I listen to the podcast while watching the episode on mute. Mm. So I created almost like my own director's cut. Right. And so I just play it and I, I do that. I'm only 15 minutes into the first episode and where I've already learned from Terry and Arnim. I'm like, whoa, I, I, like it's making me enjoy DC nine all over again. So oh, it's a great man. way to rewatch. I'm pumping them up. I know Garrett, I know Bobby. So I, I don't know, I think they watch this that they know I do a podcast, but Michael, uh, you can't do this to me. Like I have so little time already, but now I've got to, I've got to do it. Like I, I like, I like Robbie and I like Garrett, but like, I love DS nine and I love Terry Farrell. And I love, uh, she's Arnold. amazing. Uh, you know what you're really going to hate is the first episode is three hours long. <laughs> Well, the first okay. podcast i will i will i will suck it in all day long <laughs> yeah so so that's my thank you i you know i love podcasters i i would i would never have become a podcaster if it wasn't for the pandemic to tell you the truth and jim us having this opportunity um so i appreciate people who watch this but i also appreciate um so many creatives out there where we get a little insight insight into the things we love al what about you what's your gratitude uh, so as we're recording this, we're coming off a pretty uh, major convention weekend um, uh, between uh, PAX Unplugged and Dragon Meat over in the UK. Uh, and I just want to give a big shout out to anyone who volunteered to run Star Trek Adventures at the cons. Um, I've heard uh, uh, several different people were running tables and a lot of uh, a lot of excitement around the the adventures that they were running. So uh, thank you for for doing that and you know pushing uh, the game. And a lot of people reporting that there's new there were a lot of new people sitting at their tables that had never seen Star Trek Adventures before. So if we can just hook them a couple at a time, yes. uh, you know. I, and I know that there's more and more conventions coming up. Uh, so uh, you know, keep volunteering to run tables and get some new players, and we'll keep building this for the happiest game on earth for sure. Aaron? Um, I have been visiting a lot of used bookstores and I want to give gratitude to a local one here in Lansing called Curious Bookshop. Um, if I have a missing Star Trek book, you know, one of the old one of the old pocket books or something like that, it's always a joy to be able to walk into any of those kinds of places and just find find it randomly. And walking out with the one thing you really wanted. I mean, that doesn't happen all the time, but it's always a treasure hunt. And I think we should thank those places for being in business and collecting all these books for us to find. Heck later yeah. on. All, all I do, because I'm so behind on collecting the novels I have on my electronic form, all I do is hope that something, someday I do some amazing thing in life where Scott Pearson wills him wills me his entire collection <laughs> he has the most amazing collection of star trek books ever and it's even more impressive in person i'll just say that out loud. oh you've seen it oh i'm jealous oh you got me jim you just killed me all right bc your gratitude sure i'm i'm gonna have to extend my gratitude to dr aaron mcdonald partially because she started this conversation and also partially because I think she said on one of your previous uh, podcasts that uh, she she had a lot of uh, in involvement with the shaping of the the character of Rock Talk from Prodigy, who I she just did. adore. And I just love her evolution <laughs> where 
people assume that she's going to be the the security officer, but she really has her heart set on science. I just, I love her story. Yeah, BC, I'm going to give you a little spoiler, which people may have watched by the time this comes out, but you're going to hear a lot about the origin of Rock Talk on our Jackson our Jackson Lansing Colin Kelly episode that's coming out soon. You're going to love how RPG translates into media. Huh, Jim? You remember that? <laughs> You're going to love this interview, PC. All right, Jim, take us out. All right. So I'm going to drag this out a little bit only because you've all brought it up. So, um, Michael, I, I, I saw Scott's collection at his house before he moved so his his basement was mostly all his office and it was like wall to wall star trek novels books paraphernalia soundtracks stuff like and now now that he's moved um elsewhere he he built like a a little uh separate building in his like backyard that's just his office and stuff and and that's all star trek it's just like literally wall to wall several shelves high it's just so much stuff it's so impressive and i i hope i mean not that i ever want to wish ill on him but i hope that he donates that library to somebody or to some organization someday make it the scott pearson library <laughs> why do we have death we we're, we're we're all talking about these posthumous hopes for his collection <laughs> i want i want him to be around a long time uh, and then only because um aaron mentioned it um, I want to just highlight two two finds. I went to a used bookstore a couple of weeks ago, and they had a copy of Star Trek Klingon for the Galactic Traveler by Mark Okrand that cost me all of two dollars. So I was excited to find that. And then they had because uh, because I, I, we we had just talked to uh, Derek Attico, Derek Tyler Attico about his uh, autobiography of uh, Cisco. Mm-hmm. They had a copy of the autobiography of James T. Kirk in hardcover for ninety two cents. What? How can you pass that up for 92 cents? So anyway. That's why you have to support these stores. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Um, so, um, and I'm excited because I'm going to Minnesota for the holidays. There are a metric F ton of used bookstores in the Twin Cities area. And I'm going to hit as many of them as I can, because that's what I do when I'm up in the up in the Twin Cities for the holidays. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, but to my gratitude, then, it, gratitude to all the fans. Uh, Al highlighted it, that there are fans out there running running the game at conventions, at your local game stores, at blah, 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 wherever you're running them. Thank you, thank you, thank you for running the game. Um, um, you are building the game one person at a time, which is how you got to do it. Uh, we're doing it for the, with the show. You're doing it right there on the front lines with getting new people involved. And I will put in a shameless plug. If you are a gamer, if you are a game master or you're a player and you want to run this game at conventions and you need some support, reach out to Modifius, join the Silver Shields, because you will get access to exclusive convention adventures that we have written for you for Star Trek Adventures that like nobody knows about except unless you're on the inside. And Mr. Al Spader wrote four of them. So, and uh, Allison uh, uh, CB or Allison Seib, CB, I can't remember, Seib, right? Seib, Seib. I uh, wrote the other four. So those eight exclusive adventures are out there for you if you join the Silver Shields and commit to running the game at conventions. Um, so go do that and we will be eternally grateful. Um, and then I will close it off. Uh, we recently lost a super fan, uh, Doug Burke, the uh, uh, last couple of weeks. Uh, I, have known, I have known him and have interacted with him for almost 30 years, way back in the day on the last Unicorn Games Trek forums. Um, he passed away recently, so uh, much love to him and his family. And uh, thank you for all you did. And uh, we will remember you. Wonderful. All right. Well, everyone, again, BC, thank you. And any super fan, anybody want to introduce subjects? We love it. It gives us so much to talk about. So IDIC, appreciate you so much. Live long and prosper. Be safe. Be well. Live long. We'll see you soon.